Welcome to BGRLearning.com, and I'm your host, Larry Salmon. So I'm going to be talking about here in this new series, this is the first part of a new series, something that is a practice that is extremely controversial, extremely countercultural. Um, when I say it, um, some people will be triggered just by talking about it at all. And that is the practice of wife spanking and then the broader practice of wife discipline. Um, in later, in the last couple of centuries, it was referred to as domestic discipline, but it's been called other things throughout history. Okay. Um, and now people will say, yeah, well, I know people used to beat their wives, but that was wrong. Okay. <laughs> well, well, hang on a second. Okay. Number one, I'm not saying that every way in which men um, used to um, beat their wives or, or, or discipline their wives was right. So, so do not think I'm saying that. Please do not shut me out. Listen to the biblical and historical case that I will make for this throughout this series. In this first podcast, I'm going to talk just about the biblical basis because I think we have to lay that foundation first because just because something happened throughout history does not make it right. Okay, I would, I would myself have argued that many times, okay? Just because the church fathers said something doesn't make it right, okay, to do something, okay? So so I'm not saying because there's historical precedence for this going back thousands of years that, that this is um, right because it has historical precedence. But if you can show scripturally that there is a scriptural um, allowance for this, and even a prescription for a man to discipline his wife, which I will show here. Okay. Now it doesn't, again, discipline doesn't always have to be physical and in court hearings, which I will talk about in later podcasts, um, uh, courts talked about non other non-physical disciplinary means that men use like sending their wives to the room, forbidding them from going out of the house to be with their friends or whatnot. Okay. So there are, there are non-physical things that men can do. Okay. And not every person can, um, do not every man can do physical discipline for various reasons. Um, <clears throat> but my point being is, is that, um, domestic discipline, number one, isn't just wife spanking, even though today it is almost exclusively associated with wife spanking. Um, it can be non-physical discipline. It really is domestic discipline, all the things involved in discipline, physical or non-physical. Um, but the physical aspect of it, wife spanking itself is actually very allowable. And I'm going to go through and I'm going to prove that case. Um, if you will just give me a little time. I know some of you listening to this are extremely triggered by this. Um, but just listen and, and understand that, that a lot of the things that we believe today that we have been con culturally conditioned to believe about the treatment of women, marriage, love, all those kind of things is absolutely unbiblical goes against historic precedent, but most importantly, biblical precedent. Because again, history can be wrong. People could be wrong in things that they did throughout history. We can all agree with that, okay? Just because there's a historical precedent doesn't make it right. But if there is a biblical backing for it, then the historical precedent just makes it stronger, not weaker, okay? So with that being said, let's jump in here into the biblical case for domestic discipline. This is the biblical case for domestic discipline. My first point on this is that God is not against physical discipline. Now, in our modern era, we are very much, I mean, like, if you went back even 80, 100 years ago, they were still sometimes, as a public punishment, tying men up to posts and flogging them, okay? The military did it. Other people did it, okay? Um, our aversion to physical punishment in any way um, is a, is a, a byproduct of the feminization of our society. Okay. Um, women typically do not like to see people physically punished. Okay. And that feminization, and it's really part of the, the, the humanism as well. Humanists, women in general, and humanists do not like to see the physical punishment of people, even though, as I'm going to show you here in a moment, physical punishment is all over the Bible. It is prescribed. It's not just, you know, people say, well, well, some things in the Bible are descriptive and other things are prescriptive. Well, guess what? Physical discipline, physical chastening. Chastening is most often described in the Bible in physical terms. Okay. And like 80% of the time, 90% of the time, chastening is is physical. It means 
beating someone. Okay. Now there were limits. There were things like, and, and the way you beat them, like the Bible shows on their backside, not the front, you know, not the face, those kind of things like that. Okay. But physical discipline is all throughout the Bible. So God is not against physical discipline. That's point number one here. Okay. Proverbs 23, 13 says, withhold not correction from the child for if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. If thou beatest him with the rod, we don't like that term beat, beat the child, beat the wife. Okay. And, and like today, like the most, the, the most heinous thing you could say is he was a wife beater. Okay. Um, if a person beats their child, you call him a child beater. You're a child beater. Now, yes, people who don't like corporal punishment for children would say that. That's how they can make it sound bad. But the Bible literally says this. For if thou beatest him with the rod, he shall not die. In other words, if you do it right, if you spank him on the backside, okay, our backs are made for this. Our, our, our backs, our buttocks, especially our butts are made for this, folks. Okay. In Proverbs 19.18, the Bible says, Chasten thy son while there is hope, and let not thy soul spare for his crying. In other words, they're going to cry, they're going to be upset. Do it anyway. So point number two, though, is that physical discipline is not only for children, but it is prescribed for adults as well. See, a lot of people would say, well, yeah, Larry, the, the Bible's talking about, you know, a, a parents uh, spanking their children. Uh, that's okay. That's okay. But not for adults. Not for adults. If you spank an adult, if you, if, if you, if you whip an adult on the backside, um, uh, that's treating them like a child. Um, wrong again. Okay. Deuteronomy 25, 1 to 3 states, if there be a controversy between men, and they come unto judgment, and the judges may judge them. Then they shall justify the righteous and condemn the wicked. And if it shall be, if the wicked man be worthy to be beaten, be worthy to be beaten, that the judge shall cause him to lie down and be beaten before his face according to his fault by a certain number. So he, what, what's talking about there is he, he would be um, lied down on his belly, okay, with his back up okay people were beaten with their back the stripes would be on their back okay 40 stripes so this is verse 3 deuteronomy 25 3 40 stripes he may give him and not exceed lest if he should exceed and beat him above these stripes thy brother should seem vile unto thee and what is that should seem vile meaning it would it would be unhuman inhumane it would be inhumane to continually beat someone nonstop. Okay. So God does place limits and, and there are other limits too. Exodus 21 gives limits on, on how people, the limits of how someone can be beaten. Um, and it talks about, um, that it, like if a person knocked, they, they, they were allowed to beat their servants. Right. But if they did something where they didn't get up in a day or two, then they would be punished. Okay. Um, <laughs> that, that, um, the master would be punished. Okay. That, that if, um, they knocked out the, the the slave's tooth or 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 damaged their eye. The slave would be set free for that. So in other words, um, what, what that's all showing us, if you look uh, how you would get damaged to your teeth and eyes, is don't hit them in the head. Okay, God does not allow us to discipline people by punching them in the head. Now, I mean, a slap on the face, open-handed slap on the face. I think is acceptable. I don't think that violates that principle, but you shouldn't do anything that risks damage to a person's face and, and their eyes, their teeth, you know, breaking their nose. The, the, the head is not really meant as a disciplinary section of the body. The backside, the buttocks, and even the back itself can take discipline. That's what it's meant for. Okay. So, so as far as that's a, that's an acceptable area of discipline. All right. So yes, God places limits on discipline, but yet God does prescribe physical discipline, the beating of people for doing what is wrong. Our whole aversion to this in our modern society is absolutely wrong. I think we would get rid of so much crime if we brought back public beatings and, and, and somebody's found guilty of something, you know, whether it's stealing or whatever, and you hook them up to a pole and you've got hundreds of people around them and you beat that person 40 stripes. I mean, come on, this would, a lot of these things would help our society. Okay. Um, Luke 12, 47 to, in Luke 12, 47 to 48, Jesus, uh, when telling the parable of servants who did not the will of their master, um, and, and how they would, he said, talked about how they would be beaten. Okay. He said this in Luke 12, 47 to 48, Jesus said, and that servant 
which knew his Lord's will and prepared not himself, neither did according to his will, shall be beaten with many stripes. But he that knew not and did not commit things worthy of stripes shall be beaten with few stripes. For unto whom much is given of him, much sh shall much be required, and to whom men have committed much of him shall they ask more. <laughs> In other words, if the servant did some things that were really worthy of stripes, he's going to get a lot. If a servant did did things out of ignorance, really no, but he still did things wrong, he's still going to get stripes. He's still going to get beaten. Both of them are going to get beaten, but the level of beating is going to be different. So the Bible's teaching here another prescription of that we moderate. You know, you, you, you don't give the same, you don't give full 40 um, whips, you know, for, for just anything. You know, sometimes it might be worthy of five. Sometimes it might be worthy of 10. But 40 is like the maximum, like you did the worst possible thing you could do kind of thing, right? So the Bible is is giving these limits on physical punishment. So, because that's a lot of the times I hear people say when I talk about this, I'm, I'm probably one of the, I haven't found anybody who talks about physical discipline in as much detail as I do. And I do have some podcasts um, that I recorded earlier than these. I kind of, kind of went backwards. I wrote, on my blog, the biblical case for domestic discipline, and then um, I went and did podcasts on how to implement physical discipline based on my um, counseling with men over the years and helping them to implement it in their marriage. So now I'm coming back and I'm giving the biblical basis for it in podcast format. I had already written on it um, extensively on my site, but in the, in these podcasts, I can go into more detail and just talk more um, freely about some of this stuff. <laughs> Um, but, uh, my point being is that people come after me about this and they'll say, Oh, you think men could do whatever they want? And they could just knock their wife's head around. I'm like, no, no I, I never said that. Okay. Um, and it shouldn't be like this uncontrolled thing. It should be just like a parent with a child that it's a controlled discipline. Okay. And I just want to come back to this point here. It is not infantilizing or treating a woman like a child or treating one's wife like a child to physically discipline, to spank or physically discipline their wife. Okay. That is absolutely false. Okay. It is treating her like a woman. When people say you're treating a woman like a child. No, it's treating her like a woman. Men and women, adults can be physically disciplined. Okay. For doing wrong, punished, physically punished, corporal punishment for doing wrong. It is not treating her like a child. It is treating her like a wife, like a woman. That is acceptable. Okay. Um, and then in uh, John 2, 13 to 15, this last uh, scripture passage here on the second point that the Bible does prescribe and allow the physical discipline of adults. Okay. Not just children. In 1 John 2, 13 to 15, um, Jesus Christ himself did this. Okay. Uh, it says, uh, again, John 2, 13 to 15, John 2, 13 to 15 says this, and the Jews Passover was at hand and Jesus was at Jerusalem and found in the temple, those that sold oxen and sheep and doves and the changers of money. And when he had made a scourge of small cords, he made a whip. Okay. He drove them all out of the temple and the sheep and the oxen and poured out the changers money and overthrew the tables. What do you think he did with that whip, folks? Think he was just whipping it into the air? No, he drove them out with it, which means he made contact with their bodies. Okay? He was whipping them in the backside, in the legs, in the back of their legs, in the back of their rear ends, the back of their, their, their backs. Okay? They were getting whipped to drive them out of the temple. That was Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, God in the flesh, using physical discipline. So... Again, those who think that, you know, physical discipline, well, it's just for children, but nobody else. False. Absolutely false. And it does not infantilize a man or a woman to physically discipline them. So our first two points were God is not against physical discipline, that he actually prescribes it in the Bible several places. Um, and number two, physical discipline is not just for children, that it's for adults as well. It does not infantilize a man or a woman. Okay. Point number three. And this is a very important point. A husband is to love his wife as Christ loves the church and Christ disciplines his wife. I can't tell you how many people have reached out to me and have said, a man hitting his wife 
raising his hand in any way to his wife, spanking his wife, is not loving his wife as Christ loves the church. I beg to differ, friend. That's your feelings. That is not the word of God. Okay? Um, the Bible tells us, and I'm going to show you this here in a moment, that Christ does discipline his church, and it is an act of love. But let me read Ephesians 5 first. Ephesians 5, 25 to 27 says this. This is Ephesians 5, 25 to 27. Husbands, love your wives even as Christ also loved the church. And that's what all the, the, the liberals, everybody loves that part of the verse. Then they want to just skip the rest of the chapter, okay? Or at least the next few verses. But love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. Oh, that that's, sounds so romantic. Until you understand the larger context of what it's saying. That he might sanctify and cleanse it with the washing of water by the word. That he might present it to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. So here is the picture that the Bible is presenting. The Bible is saying that Christ gave himself up. So in, in another passage, it says he purchased the church with his blood. So Christ gave his blood, the most valuable thing he had for this woman, this church, this his bride, right? A, a picture, a man, a wealthy man, okay? And he comes by and, and he sees this raggedy taggedy, you know, young girl here, um, you know, maybe she's a, a, a servant or slave or whatever she is. This woman that, you know, she doesn't look real good. Her clothes don't look good. And she just doesn't even, you know, isn't nice. And she's hurling insults at him. And he says to her, her, her master or her father, or whoever, he says, I want her. And I will give you everything I have for her because I see the potential. I see what I can do with her. I know what I'm going to do with her. Yes, she's not presentable now. Yes, she, she's raggedy taggedy. She's foul mouth. She's, she's not nice. I'm going to take her and I am going to transform her into a glorious woman. That's the picture here. That is the picture. It is politically incorrect, but that is the picture here that the Bible is giving here. Okay? That he might sanctify it. He, he didn't take on the church because you get these pastors, oh, he just thought the church was so beautiful. No, no, no. He, the church wasn't, his bride wasn't beautiful and wonderful. No, she was ugly and tattered and torn. And he took her so that he could cleanse her, so that he could wash her, bathe her, and put good clothing on her and make her look beautiful and then turn her into the glorious wife, the glorious church. That he wanted her to be not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that it should be holy and without blemish. Just imagine that picture, okay? So, that is the picture of Christ loving his church. He did not give himself up because, oh, I saw this beautiful woman. I just want to do anything to make her happy. That's the, that's the thing that we get in churches all the time today. But that's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible does not teach this this thing of, oh, men worship their wives and want to make them happy. They give themselves up for the wife's happiness. No, Christ gave himself up to purchase this raggedy, taggedy woman that was muddy and dirty and foul-mouthed and mean. He bought her to change her. He bought her to mold her. He gave his all to get her, to make her into the wife he wanted her to be, folks. And if you let that settle in, that concept, that will really change your approach to marriage and the way you approach male-female relationships and understanding it. The Bible doesn't approach it in the romantic terms that people try and read into the scriptures today, okay? So, but the main principle here before we get into the next point is that husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church, right? Let's take that principle. That is a huge scriptural principle, right? We hear that all the time. Egalitarians teach it. Uh, complementarians teach it. All Christians teach this, okay? Oh, men are supposed to love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. And then skip the rest of the verses, right? They skip the rest of verse, you know, 26 to 27, missing the larger point. But, you know, 
and then they just infuse in what they think that love is. They just read into it, put all these romantic notions into it, right? Okay. Um, Revelation 3.19 gives us an attribute of Christ's love besides what we saw there. Because er, later on in the passage, it says that husbands love their wives by caring for them as their own bodies, taking care of their physical needs, right? By nurturing and cherishing them. Cherish means to keep warm, that you clothe your wife, okay? Um, and that clothing is a protection as well. Clothing is both a provision and, and a protection, right? Um, so men are to lead, um, provide for, and protect their wives, okay? They're And they are to feed and to clothe them. And that clothing is both provision and protection from the elements, right? So, um, but there's other aspects of men loving their wives, not just leading, providing, and protecting them. See, um, complementarians will not deny that, oh, yeah, men are supposed to lead their wives, okay? Uh, uh, so, so men are to provide leadership for their wives. Um, so they'll say, oh, yeah, men lead, provide, protect. Yeah, 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 yeah. But as soon as you get to the discipline section, and I'm going to talk about this in an upcoming podcast in this series, they they drop out. Oh, no, 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 no. A husband can't discipline his wife. He can't, he can't force her to do anything. No, 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 no. So, because for them, the husband is simply a figurehead leader. Again, you know, I'll get into that later. But scripturally speaking, if you want scriptural marriage, true biblical patriarchal marriage, not complementarian, the complementarian compromise with egalitarianism, um, Revelation 3.19 gives us what another core aspect of Christ's love for his church, okay? As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Listen to that again. As many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. Okay? And now Jesus is saying this. If you look, and in, in right before this in Revelation 3 and in 2, Jesus is talking to his churches. He goes through his churches, and he's telling each one of them. He's saying, hey, this is what you're doing wrong. This is what you're doing wrong. One of them he didn't, but he's saying to all of them, you know, like, or, or to most of them, he's saying, he's saying, uh, this is what you're doing wrong. And if you don't do this, I'm going to discipline you. Okay. And then at the end of it, he says, as many as I love, he's talking about his churches. I rebuke and discipline. Be zealous, therefore, and repent. So Christ as an act of love disciplines his. Now, and, and, and some people get confused by that. Church is plural, church singular. The Bible refers, <laughs> it's, it's kind of similar to the Trinity in this way. Um, we're, 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 we're God, um, is three in one, right? Okay. It's God, the father, God, the son, God, the Holy spirit, three in one. All right. Um, but yet, you know, God says in Genesis, let us make man in our own image, a reference to the Trinity, right? Okay. So God can be spoken of both singular and plural in the sense of when he's talking about us as the Trinity, right? The three in one, right? Okay. But there is yet one God, right? So yes, we will say, well, <clears throat> there's one church. Yes. There's one universal church, but there are local manifestations of that church, right? Okay. And so the Bible speaks to both the church in the epistles um, and to um, churches, the churches. Okay. So um, Christ has this relationship and Christ loves and chastens his church or his churches. Okay. And so the thing is, is we can't separate this. So when the, when people try and say that husbands, um, uh, have no, can't, can't discipline their wives. Okay. You're literally going against what the scriptures say is an act of a part of a husband's love. Yes. Husbands are to lead, provide, protect, but they're also to discipline. And, and really the discipline is alluded to as well in Ephesians 5, 25 to 27, where I talked about, where I just read it to you, where a husband is to sanctify and cleanse his wife. Right. Okay. And that, that rebuking and that discipline process follows that. So he washes her with the word, as it says, he shows her scripturally, Hey, you violated God's word. Here's where you violated it. Now here is. The consequence, so, and it might have just been you disobeyed me as your husband. God's word says you're to obey me in everything, unless it's sin. You're to obey me in everything, and you chose to go against that. You chose to to go against what I said. Here's a punishment for that. Okay, um, so that's where we we see this here. So so for this third principle, a husband is to love his wife as Christ loves the church, and Christ disciplines his wife. This is a scriptural principle that is all but ignored, pretty much ignored in our modern churches today. Very, very, very few, maybe backwoods churches 
will still teach this, that husbands need to discipline their wives, that it is not only a right, but a responsibility. And it is a part of a husband loving his wife as Christ loves his church. And um, finally, I want to address um, the <laughs> argument that, well, Larry, <clears throat> the, the, the Bible addresses um, uh, men being beaten. Okay, you've shown that. And, and, and uh, children being beaten by their parents. But it never, it never prescribes it for women. It never, never even mentions it, never prescribes it there. So, so, the, so God must not want us to do that. Okay. Um, just because the Bible doesn't specifically command or mention a specific thing does not mean that God doesn't want us to do it or that it's not allowed. Okay. Um, I'm just going to give you one example here. Um, I could give you more, but I'm just going to give you one example. If you were to ask most people today, can uh, a wife divorce her husband for physically abusing her? Okay. I'm not talking about discipline, control, physical discipline. I'm talking about a man that's using his wife's head as, you know, a punching bag. Okay. Um, I'm talking about, about a man who's truly physically disciplining his wife. He's breaking her arm. He's busting teeth out. He's, you know, <laughs> I mean, he's, he's just, he's abusing his authority, his God given authority. Okay. So can a man, can a wife, dis can a wife divorce her husband for physical abuse? You won't find that anywhere in the Bible. Never mentions it. Now, I mean, the Bible mentions, you know, uh, wives being freed from their husbands in Exodus 21, 10 to 11 for if the husband does not provide food clothing or sex. Okay. But it never says a wife can divorce her husband for physical abuse. So that has led some Christians to say, oh, well, then they're not allowed. No. Okay. You can derive it from a larger principle, just like you can derive that a husband can discipline his wife based on the principle of Christ disciplining his church, that he not only can, that he should. Okay. But as far as his physical abuse goes, that principle is derived from Exodus 21 to 26 to 27, where it states that if a master knocks out the tooth of his slave, if he, ma if he knocks out, if he hurts their eye, that they should be freed. So in other words, if he causes any physical, um, any, any permanent physical, serious physical damage or life risking damage, um, that slave was to be freed. And guess what? Um, if we understand the principle, that from first Peter three, five to six, that the husband is called the master of the wife. The husbands are masters of their wives. Okay. So there, there's a master of a wife and there's a master of a slave in the Bible, right? Okay. Now, now obviously the responsibilities of a husband as master to his wife are different than those of a master to their slave and the responsibilities of a wife, I would argue toward her husband are greater than that of a slave toward their master. Okay. Um, but that's another, another topic for another day. So, but the point being is that if a slave could be freed from their master for true physical abuse, knocking their teeth out, damaging their eye, things like that, okay, um, so too this would apply to a wife if her master, her husband, does these things to her that she could be free from him. So, again, I'm using the larger biblical principle that God does not tolerate physical abuse even for slaves, let alone for free children or free wives, okay? so. I can show, biblically speaking, that yes, a wife can be divorced from her husband for serious physical abuse. And again, the Bible didn't speak to that specifically, but we can derive it from larger principles. And there's many other areas in life um, that, that, that we could apply biblical principles to those things to determine the morality of it. The Bible doesn't speak specifically to everything, but it gives a principle that will apply to any moral issue. You can always find a principle in the Bible that will apply to all moral areas of life. Okay. Um, and again, I want to emphasize that, that the larger principle of Christ loving his church and disciplining her because he loves her, chastening her because he loves her. Okay. Absolutely proves the case that men have a, a right and an obligation to discipline their wives. Now, again, I'm not saying it has to be physical. I believe it is allowed physically. And I believe that physical discipline, I've seen this in my counseling, um, that, that it works wonders <clears throat> and it is so much faster than non-physical discipline and bringing about change in a wife. But not all men are able to do that. I am, I'm one of the men who are not able, I'm not able to do that. And, um, and I explain that, um, uh, more, um, in, in my, uh, 
podcast. You, if you look at a podcast that I recorded previously, um, a, a guide to husbands imp- implementing domestic discipline in their marriage, I explain that. And there's two different podcasts on that where I even do some follow-up questions for men um, on how to determine if your wife is a candidate for physical discipline. Not And not in every marriage in this day is it is it advisable for men to do that. But um, having said that, um, every man must discipline his wife in one way or the other whether physically or non-physically. Um, but my point here is, is that um, uh, physical discipline is absolutely allowed for women. Um, it does not infantilize them. It is not um, abusing women or, or, or be acting in an unmanly way like we're taught. And a, 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 a gentleman never raises his hand to a woman. Well, maybe a gentleman doesn't, but a godly man does. <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the the gentleman stuff comes from you know the chivalry uh chivalrous movement and treating women like princesses and it's just totally unbiblical it is unbiblical historically it was rejected uh for the most part i mean some circles uh, there there is some exception okay i i am gonna go um and show um in history where there were some debates between like um john christian well, not between. They didn't actually debate each other. Okay. But but what they said during the same time period, they, were, they lived during the same period, the latter end um, of the 4th century and then into the 5th century. But John Christian's, Christendom, Christendom, sorry, John Christendom and Augustine said very different things about it. We're, we're, uh, sneak peek. Um, Augustine was for wife um, discipline, the corporal punishment of wives. Okay. And John Christendom was very much opposed to it. Okay. But I will show in the series that a lot of that came from their cultures. The Greeks were very much against, um, uh, the physical discipline of women and, um, the Romans were saw, no, no, it's absolutely necessary in a family for keeping order. So, um, again, that's your sneak preview, but I'll be reading you some quotes and things to, to back up what I'm talking about in upcoming podcasts on this. <laughs> but, um, my point being here is, is that biblically speaking, um, I have shown here that um, it is not only biblically allowable, but biblically prescribed for a man to discipline his wife, and that can include physical discipline. There is no prohibition on it, and in fact, um, most of the time in the Bible, chastening discipline is physically physical. Okay. Um, <coughs> uh, having said all that. Um, I just want to just say one last thing, and that is, uh, you know, people don't really think this through. The people who, and I mean, good men of God, people who I really respect, complementarians. I mean, there's a lot of complementarians. I, I don't agree with them on everything, but but there's a lot of good men of God, even men who claim to be like biblical patriarchs, that reject the husband's ability to discipline and enforce his authority with his wife. Um, and I'm going to talk about some of them in upcoming um podcast in this series but um they really haven't thought this through that every human authority got established whether it was the civil authorities in the bible church authorities masters over their slaves that god prescribed and allowed physical discipline he just put limits on it okay and like and and what um now not with the church though the church does not have the ability to physically discipline but the civil authorities do Masters do, okay? And in the family, physical discipline is prescribed. The only place physical discipline is not prescribed is with the church, okay? And the church is a spiritual body, so that makes sense. The church is the spiritual body outside of those things, right? Where families, yes, marriage is a spiritual relationship, but it's also a physical relationship, right? Okay, it's a, and it fits into society. It's a basis for society, okay? So, but in every area except the church, God allows and prescribes even physical discipline. And you're going to tell me that here is the wife in the home and God doesn't allow any discipline of her by her husband, the authority, the head of the home. He can't do He He's just got to wish. He's got to inspire her by his quote unquote example, as complimentarians say, to follow her and just hope that she'll follow him. I mean, they're not thinking this through. That makes absolutely no sense. And you literally, you're reducing the husband from being the most powerful human authority God ever established, giving him the most personal power over any one human being than any other authority. Husbands have more powers over their wife than a king does, than a pastor does, 
than, than their fathers did, than anyone does, okay? Scripturally speaking. And yet you're neutering him by saying he can't enforce his will upon her, that he cannot punish her for disobeying him. That makes absolutely no logical sense whatsoever. And it doesn't make sense biblically either. It would neuter the husband to do that. And so that's what these men are doing. They're literally, and they don't realize it. And, but that's why, like, you'll see here in all these complimentary sites and all these masculinity Instagram pages and everything, you must inspire your wife. You must be the leader that inspires. Because they have neutered men where you can't literally enforce anything with your wife. You've just got to hope that you somehow magically inspire her to follow you. Okay? So, again, I just want to kind of get that off my chest, that frustration I have. I'm like, people, you can't see this now. And I was there too, 10 years ago, okay? And, and, and God exposed that to me. He's like, Larry, look what you're doing. You're, you're, you're making this carve out for wives going, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, what, children can be disciplined, including little girls. Little girls, little boys can be disciplined, physically disciplined. Yep, yep, you're cool with that. Um, adults can be physically disciplined. Yep, you're cool. Men, men can be physically disciplined. But women... Women cannot be physically disciplined. And I was like, where do I get that from? And I'm like thinking, it's not from the Bible. It's from the chivalry stuff that we're taught. That men, a man should never raise his hand to a woman. Okay? It's the chivalry stuff that's been in, into our culture since like around 1000 AD with the knights and all that. Right? Okay? And, and this has been put into our culture. Now, a lot of men did reject that. Okay? Because I'm going to show through my series that the corporal punishment of wives continued way past 1000 all the way through up until like the early 20th century, even mid 20th century, some men were still physically disciplining their wives, even though it had been starting to be outlawed in the late 19th century. Okay. And then you got the domestic uh, domestic violence laws that came out in, like the seventies. Okay. And then that can just kind of put a halt to most of it. Although there were some remnants of men that continued it and there still are today. Okay. And it's actually increasing again now, thankfully, because people are seeing what the scriptures say. But anyway, um, I just wanted to kind of get that off my chest, that last part about like that frustration. And I didn't realize that I was blind to it, too. That how can you have this special carve out for women? Everybody else can be physically disciplined, but not women. Little girls, little boys, men, but not women. OK, so it, it really doesn't make sense. Think about that. Um, but I have shown here the most important thing here is that biblically speaking, God is for physical punishment. It's prescribed all over the Bible. It's not just described. It's prescribed, okay? Not just descriptive, it's prescriptive, okay? Physical punishment in general, okay? And that physical punishment is not just prescribed for children. It is prescribed for adults. It's not just prescribed. Jesus Christ performed physical discipline on adults, okay? All right? And then the Bible says the husbands are to love their wives as Christ loved the church. And Revelation 3.19 tells us that Christ rebukes and disciplines, chastens, punishes his church. Okay? So that makes a rock-solid case for wife discipline. And now we're going to follow this up, That I, now that I've laid this foundation, this biblical case for domestic discipline. Okay? Um, I'm going to now show the historical precedent for domestic discipline. All right. So um, come back for, you know, the next parts of these series that I will put out there. And um, I, I, I think you'll enjoy the history. And for a lot of men that I've shown this to <laughs> at first, they, you know, when they see all the scriptures, they go, OK, can't, it makes sense, Larry. Your, your arguments make sense. The scriptures you're saying make sense. And especially Revelation 319, that Christ rebukes and chastens his church. We're supposed to love our wives. But I just. Man, I, uh, man, it just seems so weird. So, I mean, and, and once I take them from that and I have taken them through men that I've counseled in the past and I take them through the historical precedents for domestic discipline, that historical precedence, when given after I give the biblical foundation for it and then show the historical precedence for it, that historical precedence is what seals the deal with most men that I have worked with. They're like, okay, I see it. All these men throughout history, all this stuff. So, sorry about my little alarm there. But um, all throughout history, um, this has been there. And once we show that, that is what seals the deal for most guys. But anyway, um, thanks for listening and uh, come back for the rest of the series. And God be with you.